Hey Chuck, <laughs> can I ask you to explain um, facet grid again? Sure. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, that's fine. Let's see. So I already have an R Markdown document here, so I'm just going to give a quick example um, using uh, the easiest thing for me to use is probably try to think of another data set that's got good categoricals in it. Um, and facet grid. Eh. I keep using this MT card data set because it's the first one that pops to mind that has categorical data in it. Uh, let me see if if it'll link me to another one that's better. Um, yeah, beaver body temperatures. Um, let's see, we got a million of these in here. Um, yes, Iris is a classic, uh, but I don't think it's got, it's only got one category. Okay, we'll stick with MT cars. Okay, so um, basically you use facet grid sometime when instead of having like different plots for uh, like, let's say we're looking at cars. So a car is going to have a different number of cylinders in their engine. If we wanted one plot for each, uh, um, like type of car in terms of the number of cylinders in its engine, we could just do a facet wrap. It would make three plots. But if what we want is we want to compare, say, within um, some cross classified categories, like we want to compare between, we want to compare like six cylinder versus four and eight cylinder cars, but we want to separate them into automatic versus manual transmission cars with four and six cylinder engines. Um, we could do something like, like this. So I'm going to say, I'm going to say I want to look at the relationship between between the weight of a car and its gas mileage. So essentially, heavier cars take more gas to move, you know, the same distance. So that should be worse. I could then just say like G on point, and this is going to give me a quick scatter plot of um, basically you see a pretty obvious relationship like lightweight car. So weight is from low weight to high weight. And this is from bad gas mileage to good gas mileage. You'll see up here that lightweight cars tend to get great gas mileage. Really heavy cars get terrible gas mileage. American cars are over here. Um, they kind of just go down constantly, right? Um, uh, coincidentally, the American cars are also the ones that just stop going from breaking down. Um, but anyway, so maybe what we want to do is we want to break this out into something other than this. We want to see, well, maybe it's the case that within certain similar types of cars, we have a different relationship. So what I'm going to say here is I'm going to be like, well, let's first go, I'm going to facet wrap it by the number of cylinders in an engine. Now we're going to get three plots where this is four cylinder cars, six cylinder cars, and eight cylinder cars. And you'll see here, there's kind of a negative relationship again here, like this, like this. They're on average, like gas mileage is getting way worse between these, but you know, there's larger differences here between like four and eight than there are within the eight cylinder car. So this tells us a little bit more information, but maybe what we're thinking about is, well, we know manual transmission cars until the modern era got um, better gas mileage. So instead of doing facet wrap, I'm gonna swap this to facet grid and then AM is a automatic transmission variable. Oddly enough, zero is automatic transmission and one is manual. Facet grid now gives us the same four, six and eight cylinder motor, but now the plots are broken up by zero and one on the AM variable. So we've now cross stratified it. So everything here is a four cylinder car with an automatic transmission. These are four cylinder cars with manual transmissions. So we can actually like compare between these, how much of a gas mileage difference is there? And it looks like the four cylinder cars in large part get better gas mileage because they're almost all manual transmissions. So they tend to be up here and in here. So this tells us more data. We can even take it further and go like, put a geom smooth through this. Oh, that's right, it's not gonna like that. Let me go method equals LM. There we go. Um, this here is gonna draw like a line of best fit on every single one of these plots. And we can actually see that the relationship between uh, weight and gas mileage is in most of these, it's actually not that extreme. Like it's kind of minorly negative, but on these other ones, you know, it's kind of, it's uncertain except for over here in these four cylinder cars. Um, so this is just a way to 
um, stratify our data and break it out so you get an idea of relationships that exist within um, categorical subsets of your data. So the model you see here, like this line here and this line here, this line here, is actually the same regression line you would get if you did an interaction term of uh, um, weight times automatic times cylinder would get you this regression line. So it also lets you visualize interaction terms between uh, different things. So stratifying like this is actually really nice. Thank you. That's super helpful. Yeah, I do. Fa I facet everything. I'm always faceting stuff because it's just like it, you can get just get so much more information. This is a really small data set. In a big data set, the stratification really can pay off because you can see really obvious differences. Anyway. Sorry, I was just opening a file and spaced out. What was the method equals? Oh, so method equals here. So geom smooth is a generic um, layer for adding um, smooth lines through all the data on the plot, right? Um, method equals LM makes it so it's a linear regression line. LM is the function for linear regression in R. Okay. So these are straight LM lines. The default for geom smooth is something referred to as a lowest smoother or lowest spline. It's a type of local polynomial regression. Um, and it's really good for doing lines that can kind of squiggle but not like sharply turn. Um, it's a non-parametric regression line. Um, so most of us, like in our stat sequences, you know, especially if you're in a PhD program, we're probably mostly learning like linear regression and linear models. If you take certain more advanced classes like uh, Chris Adels Visualizing Data, you'll learn about things like uh, generalized additive models, which have splines. Splines are basically uh, wiggly lines that prevent them from wiggling too much. Um, and they're really useful if you don't know what kind of relationship to expect between two variables. If you fit a spline on it, it will kind of tell you what's going on. Um, and they're really useful for figuring out how to like uh, um, parameterize a statistical model. Well beyond the bounds of this class, but I highly recommend um, looking into generalized additive models, you know, when you get deeper into stats and stuff. Um, anyway, um, any other kind of quick questions before I get rolling here? Yeah. I'm sorry, which two variables were the interaction terms between in, the, in that last facet grid that you did? Uh, so here, this is essentially these lines are equivalent to a three-way interaction of, uh, this would be, the, the this line would represent the beta you would get for a interaction of uh, weight, which is the x variable, automatic transmission, which is zero or one, and cylinder. So this is a three-way interaction, the sort of thing that you don't normally do ever. Three-way interactions are funky, um, but it works for categorical. So these regression lines are the same regression lines you get by doing it. So if I actually do uh, MPG weight times AM times cylinder, whoop, it equals MT cars, and I run this model, um, the actual interaction term, um, if you, uh, well, if you calculated the actual partial derivative with regard to the X variable, you would end up with uh, the lines represented by this, which is all, uh, um, this is way beyond the bounds of this class, people. Uh, the, what, what's basically the idea is that regression lines are just drawing a partial derivative of some relationship. Um, and you can actually get that out by stratifying your data with categorical variables and recover the one you'd see in the uh, regression model. The thing with regression models that's nice is you can have an arbitrarily large number of dimensions. It gets really hard to visualize things with more than three dimensions for the human brain, but your regression model is perfectly happy to have a 20, 20 100,000th of dimensional model. So, stats are fun, but this is not one of my stats classes. So we're gonna go back to R. Okay, yeah. Uh, oh yeah, no, Tristram's right there. Splines is a term from woodworking that found its way into stats. Yeah, a spline is basically a piece of wood. Um, if you can see on my camera, if you can imagine, if you've got like a piece of paper representing a piece of wood, if you put a couple pegs in it that bend this thing like this in a shape, a spline is actually created on your model by specifying essentially the number of pegs that you would have on a bent piece of paper or wood, and it can only bend so through the data based on the number of pegs you put in. 
Well, when you do a low S smooth or a GG plot, it determines essentially the number of bends the thing can have and how tight the bends are um, based on your data to get an ideal fit. And that's actually how spline models work is they essentially figure out the number of pegs to fit and how to bend something. And it's derived from the woodworking idea because that would be a way to create a curved shape um, when woodworking to make you know, curvatures through things. I do a little bit of woodworking, not so much in the last few years, but I used to. And so same thing, it resonates with me. I'm like, spline, yeah, okay. Okay, now tangents are over. We're gonna start moving. Unless you have some other questions. Okay, so today uh, is one of the most important lectures of the term. Uh, today is manipulating and summarizing data using primarily dplyr. So um, this is a real heavy lifting sort of lecture. You're gonna learn a lot of powerful stuff today that you'll use in every other homework and every other uh, thing and probably most projects that you would do in R, you're probably gonna be using a lot of dplyr unless you go on to something like uh, data.table if you prefer that sort of style of writing code, which I don't talk about in this course. Okay. So today's theme is uh, depth to spreadsheets. Um, so the idea is that you don't want to be doing your data manipulation, your calculations, any of that kind of stuff in something that is bad for you like Excel, okay? The dplyr package is a package that does just about anything you could do in Excel, in fact almost exactly everything you could do in Excel, but will do it more transparently, reproducibly, safely, um, and also of course drastically more quickly. Um, and when you get to even a little bit of familiarity with dplyr, you can actually write the code faster than you could use pull down menus in Excel to get the same thing done. Um, yeah, uh, this is an older example here, but do not be the next poor research assistant who makes lots of headlines due to Excel errors in a spreadsheet. There was actually a more recent one somebody sent me um, showing how uh, I forget which health service had lost an enormous number of COVID test results because, yeah, the truncated British COVID list. Um, so basically, uh, there is a maximum number of observations you can open up in Excel in a spreadsheet. And nowadays, data get big. It turns out the maximum length uh, is pretty small. Um, so what happened is they lost all the additional data that was being added. Normally you can open up an almost arbitrarily long Excel. Yeah, they were missing 16,000 rows, right? Because um, Excel is bad. Excel is bad for all sorts of other reasons. This is just one of them. You could spend all day having a class on things Excel does that's bad. Um, yeah, many people have lost many days, hours, you know, years of their life using Excel to do research. Um, so unfortunately, uh, that's a thing, but hopefully you won't have to do it anymore. Excel has a few really good uses, but almost none of them have to do with the stuff people actually use it for in the social sciences. Okay, so what we're going to talk about is first modifying data frames using dplyr. So uh, one first thing I want to talk about, though, that's key to using these tidyverse things that I brought up last week and a lot in lab is the use of pipes. Dplyr uses the Magritter forward pipe operator, usually simply called a pipe when you're working in R. You write pipes with the text percent greater than percent, and you can insert them using Control Shift M or uh, Command Shift M on a Mac. I'm not sure. So pipes are simple. What pipes do is they take whatever you put on the left side of the pipe and shove it in the thing on the right side of the pipe. They move things from the left to the right. So you can look at it kind of like an arrow. It says whatever's on the left side, put it in the thing on the right, which is a pretty simple concept, but it actually gives you a lot of power. So we can do things like this. I load up the dplyr package. I load up the gapminder data we used for this homework, this last homework. I say, take the gapminder data and then, so we're gonna read pipes in language, read a pipe as the words and then. So take the gapminder data and then filter those data so that country is equal to Canada and then head to, which is get the first two observations. So what it does is it takes gapminder data, it puts it into the filter command, filters it, takes the output of that filter command and puts it in head and gets the first two observations. 
what we see down here are only observations from Canada because it filtered the Gapminder data down to Canada. This is really nice, right? We're leading, reading left to right and the operations happen in the sequence we read them left to right. So pipes are nice because they save us some typing. Instead of doing things like having to say, uh, like Gapminder dollar sign country in here using like the base filter uh, version, we just send the data into here and then give it an operation. We create fewer objects. I don't have to say like filter the Gapminder data to something and then make that object put it in head. I can write less stuff. We can chain an arbitrarily large number of these uh, together. So they make our lives a little bit easier. They are not necessary for anything. Pipes are just a something that um, programmers call syntactic sugar. Um, they basically are a way to take um, the syntax that you're writing and make it a little bit easier to use and digestible and more intuitive. So here's a question. Is there a benefit to equals equals versus percent in for this example? For a single thing on the right side, equals equals and percent in are nearly identical. Um, the only difference between equals equals and percent in is that if the thing on the, um, if this country here was an NA, a missing value, this statement returns an NA. If this is an NA and this is percent in, it returns a false. Otherwise, they're equivalent. If you want it to behave in one of those ways, use the appropriate operator. I'm going to show some examples of that in this lecture a little bit later. But percent in is almost equivalent to equals equals for a single comparison. Okay, so using pipes. Um, pipes are clearer to read and write and sort of interpret if you put each function call on its own line to give you an idea what's happening. So you might say something like, I'm going to take some particular set of data and then I'm going to do something with it with some additional arguments. And then I'm going to do another thing with some other arguments, and then I'm going to do a third thing, and then I'm going to do a fourth thing, and then I'm going to do a fifth thing. If you put them each on their own line, it's clear it just sort of flows from the top left to the bottom. Okay. So as I said again, pipes just work by taking whatever is on the left side of the pipe and passing it to the thing on the right side. The thing on the right side is almost always a function, and what happens with the pipe is it just passes the thing on the left side to the first argument of the function on the right side. So on the previous slide here, if you look up the documentation for dplyr's filter command, filter's first argument is a data set. Its first argument is not a statement like this. This is its second argument is a logical statement. What we're actually doing, this code right here, could be rewritten. So I have this code. I could rewrite it instead as head filter gapminder Canada. So if I, uh, okay. So this line up here gives me these two lines of Canada. This one down here, uh, oh, I forgot to do head too. There we go. These are equivalent lines, okay? What the pipe lets us do is instead of writing things inside out where we start with the Gapminder data, then filter it down to Canada, then take the first two observations, we're doing them sequentially. Begin with the Gap Gapminder data, then filter it so that country equals Canada, and then get the head. They're exactly the same. So all this is doing is taking the Gapminder data, putting it here, so if you watch me convert these two, right, I could, instead of this, I could say there, that's like the first step of converting them to each other, and then the next would be wrapping it in the head statement. Pipes are just about writing your code more clearly. These lines all do exactly the same thing. The reason for that is it's easier to read your code left to right than inside out, or at least the... Uh, Many of us have that opinion. Okay. So the thing is, though, is like I just showed, the pipe passes things to the first argument of a function. If you want to pipe some data or something into a function and it, you don't want to send the data to the first argument, you can do this. 
I'm here, I'm saying, I wanna take the Yugoslavia data, which I haven't created yet, but I will in a minute, take the Yugoslavia data and then run a linear model of population on year. The thing is a linear model in R, its first argument is a formula, not the data. So to say, send the Yugoslavia data into this thing, I can say data equals period. The period is a placeholder. The period tells the pipe over here to send this thing here instead of into the first argument. The way that works is somewhat magical and I won't get into the technical details, but the pipe can be told where to put things from the left side if you need it. 98% of the time, you're not gonna need it because the first argument of everything in the type versus a data set, but you might have to do it if you want to pipe start and do a model. Okay, so if you want to do some operation using a pipe of dplyr type statements and you want to save the result to an object, you do the assignment first and then you do the piped operation. So here I'm gonna say, what I wanna do is I want to generate a linear model of population on year. This is just a name, it's an empty object I'm about to create. I say, I'm gonna create LM pop year. I'm going to assign to it the Gapminder data and then filter them so continent equals Americas and then run my linear model where my data, which is the Gapminder data, filtered to the Americas is sent here. It's gonna get the data, filter the data, run the model, and then put the output of the model up here. So the way the assignment happens, and this is intuitive if you think about it, you decide what you're gonna make first, decide you're gonna assign something to it, and then after that, you figure out how to build that object using stuff that comes afterwards, okay? No matter how many of these statements I do in a row with the pipes, the assignment always happens first at the top. This thing could be 50 lines long right here, and as long as it's one pipe chain, I can do the assignment up at the top. You're gonna to see me do this throughout the entire class. So here's a question uh, Izzy has in chat. When there are two things that you're filtering by, but they're the same variable, such as equals equals Canada and equals equals Brazil, do you need to write it as country equals equals Canada and country equals equals Brazil? There is a more succinct way using percent in, which I'll show you in a few slides, uh, if it's the same variable. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's how you do assignment. Here's an example. So uh, if you remember, um, we've used filter a couple times. We used it a ton in the lab. Filter is for subsetting down to particular rows. This is a dplyr function for getting the rows that you want. So I say here, I want to create a data set called Canada. I'm going to assign to Canada the Gapminder data and then filter it so that country is equal to Canada. This creates the object, so I can then run head on Canada to get its first six observations. We see here all six observations are Canada. It's 1952 through 1977. I've hidden the rest of the observations because the head gives you the first six. So this here selects the rows that you want in your data set. The Excel version of this is also called filter. Filter in Excel lets you choose what rows you want in a data set using different, basically, binary statements. If something is true, give me these rows. If something is false, get rid of these other rows. The logical statements we use just go and filter up here. We're going to use filter constantly. It's a very useful function. A quick question about um, the putting the quotes around it. Do you have to put that around regardless what variable it is? Because isn't there like if it's numerical, you don't have to put quotes or something like that? So this thing that I'm with the quotes on it is not a variable at all. This is just the, uh, the word Canada. Um, and so the idea here is we're testing to see whether this country variable's values are equal to Canada. So I'll show you what I'm actually doing here. So. Right, I'm filtering down to Canada here. Well, what is this country equals equals Canada? This is actually equal to this statement right here. What this is doing, and you'll see it keeps populating because it's got to check all 1,704 rows in the data set. 
this statement inside the filter is actually checking if every individual value of the country variable in Gapminder is equal to Canada. When it is not, it returns a false. When it is, it returns a true. And then it throws away every row that it sees a false for and keeps the rows that have a true. This is how the logical statements turn from trues and falses into essentially keeping the rows. So what I'm actually doing is I'm testing if this, these values of country, which you can see right here, they look like this, right? If each one of these in text equals Canada. Well, what it's really doing essentially is it's going line by line and say it starts with Afghanistan. It's testing this. Does Afghanistan equals Canada? No. It's gonna go to the next one. Does Algeria equals Canada? No. Does Canada equals Canada? Ah, by golly, it does. It's just running through text one element at a time because this country variable contains all of these values, but they are text. You can imagine this is basically quoted text and it's just checking for when it equals Canada. So the variable over here is just a series of quoted texts like that, if that makes some sense. Yes, that's really helpful. I like the, the whys, the background. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Chuck, so, uh, um, so I know I noticed like you're only using one word, but like let's say you want to do like from Canada to like North America, all the countries in between. Um, is there like a easier way to do that instead of using percent in and then concatenating and entering each country's name individually? So you want to do so you want to do something that is between some values or something? Yeah, like between Canada, or I, I don't know, or maybe like Afghanistan and Australia, right? So like the like all the countries that alphabetically are between the two. Oh yeah, well the way that I would do this, welcome to week eight. Uh, the way I would do this is uh, I would look for um, things that uh, begin with the letter A. That will give me all the countries that begin with the letter A. Um, I would do a string manipulation. Um, we're going to learn regular expressions in week eight. Uh, so if you had something like that, the easiest way would be like, well, do with a letter. But if you were between exactly two countries alphabetically, I would extract the list of countries, uh, of unique countries, select the beginning and end, and trim the rest, which is slightly advanced. Uh, but you absolutely could. There's always a million different ways to do it. Um, so it really comes down to what you think of first. Um, if you have a small number of them, it's probably easier to just use like a list. But if you were like, you had to select the first, uh, I don't know, like, you know, 100 unique entries or something, you could also say like uh, country percent in unique uh, country, the first 10 unique countries. Oh, what did I mess up? Unique country, one to 10. That would give me the every observation from the first 10 unique countries, which looks like it goes to about Belgium. So if I did unique country 10, the first unique 10 is all the way up to Belgium. Um, Basically, there's an infinite number of clever ways to do things. It just comes down to what you think of first that's fast enough to type. But yeah, many tricksy things. Does that answer your question? Yes. Great. Good. Here's one in chat. For this data equals period, does data come from the last step? Uh, yes. So here, what's happening is it runs this line pipes it into this line and runs it. And then the period here is the result of all prior lines that ran. So this basically period is just saying, take the output of this and stick it where the period is. If the first argument to LM was the data, I wouldn't need to use this period thing over here. Um, but LM takes data as it's like second or third or fourth argument. So I just specify where it goes. It's a tricksy thing. Oh, what? Let's see what happens if we don't put data. Cannot coerce formula to a data frame. So the issue here is LM, if I get help on LM, 
LM's first argument is a formula, its second argument is data. So what it thinks that I want here is it thinks that I just said, let's do this. In other words, it thinks that we reversed them because it just sends the first two lines into the first argument over here and then pushes this over to the second argument. So these lines are equivalent and it breaks. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Keep on chugging along. Okay, so we can filter data. Um, this is that percent in operator I've now shown you and we've talked about again. Um, a common operator to do um, multiple tests that saves you the time of not writing lots of this equals that or this equals that or this equals that is percent in. Percent in we use when we want to filter so that some variable is in some set of things. So in this case, I'm going to take all the countries in former Yugoslavia that are actually in the Gapminder data set, Northern Macedonia is not in the data set, which are Bosnia and Herzegovina, Croatia, Montenegro, Serbia, and Slovenia. Okay? This is just a character vector I've written to former Yugoslavia that I'm going to use as a reference. I'm going to create some actual Yugoslavian data by saying, let's make an object called Yugoslavia. Let's assign to it the Gapminder data and then filter so that country is in former Yugoslavia. What this percent in does is it checks the values of country in the Gapminder data and anytime it encounters any of these five countries, it's going to return a true, otherwise it's going to return a false. It keeps rows when it sees a true. Basically, if the country is Bosnia and Herzegovina, Croatia, Montenegro, Serbia, or Slovenia, it's going to keep it and it's going to throw away every other country. This statement is easier to use than lots of equals equals. Yes, so in chat there, um, why can't you just do filter former Yugoslavia? Ah, filter requires a logical statement, something that returns truths and falses. If I just put former Yugoslavia, it's just a bunch of text. It doesn't know how to convert that into what I want to keep and what I want to drop. It actually needs to say, what we're looking for is when the country variable is in former Yugoslavia. So this statement right here, I can write it like, uh, I'm going to need this too. I could write it like percent in former Yugoslavia and get my Yugoslavia data, which we'll see here is all those countries. But the equivalent of this would be I could say country equals equals Bosnia and, no, it's not an and sign, Bosnia Herzegovina, or country equals Croatia, and so on and so forth. So what equals equals lets us do, do is type this in a more compact syntax than writing out every single one as repeated or statements. It's just a way to save some time. This thing statement up here would be the same as this if I wrote out every single country equals equals statement and stuck them with a bunch of ors. It'd be identical. If I instead do filter just former Yugoslavia, it's going to be like, are you a crazy person? It's going to say, this doesn't make any sense to me because what I need is a true or false and I need a true or false for every row. If there's 1,704 rows, I need something that generates 1,704 trues and falses. This thing right here, country in former Yugoslavia, again, what this produces is a series of falses and trues. The countries that our trues are are going to be Bosnia and Herzegovina, Croatia, you know, Serbia, whatever are where these trues are. It just converts trues and falses into keep and rows, which is the same way Excel does it. Okay. We're going to keep seeing a lot of this. Okay. So don't worry if it isn't completely clicking yet. Okay. So now I've generated some Yugoslavia data. Okay. So another useful dplyr function you might want to do is to see all the unique values in your data for some column or combination of columns. Maybe what I want to know is what are all the different years in my data by continent? 
I could say, take the Gapminder data and then get every distinct value of continent and year. What this would do is pr produce a data frame that only has the unique values that are combinations of continent and year. So I'll get one row of Asia 1952 because the only unique value of year and continent here, Asia 1952 through 2007, I would then go to the next continent and have all the unique years. These are the unique values. There's tons and tons of countries that are observed in 1952 in Asia, but the unique values of continent and year are only the combinations shown here. This is something good if you wanna see like, uh, uh, if I had other good categorical data, you could see um, the number of unique combinations like, uh, like in that empty cars data set of between like automatic transmissions and cylinder. This is just a way to quickly glance at your data to see what sort of things go together and what don't. Okay, one thing about the distinct function is distinct, as you see on this previous one, if I say distinct continent and year, it drops every other column in the data set. You might not want that to happen. If you say gapminder and then distinct continent year dot keep all equals true, it's still going to get the unique observations by country, or sorry, by continent and year, but it's going to keep all the other columns. Now, if you think about it, this doesn't make any sense. If I get the unique values of continent and year, how do I have a value for country, life expectancy, population, GDP per capita, because there are different values of these for every country in Asia for 1952, okay? What it's giving me is the first row in Asia in 1952, which happens to be Afghanistan with these values. Dot keep all equals true will keep whatever you would normally be dropped, but it rarely makes any sense, just as a heads up. Okay, here's a question. What's the formula for a bar chart with two bars connected to each other? For example, US is the left bar and Canada is the right bar. The X level is year and the Y label is GDP per capita. So you'd have like uh, United States grouped over on the left and then year one, two, three kind of thing. Uh, just play around with um, uh, group equals uh, either country or year. Um, and run your bar plot and it should move them or stack them around. I can play with it after afterwards if you want to see or in lab. I want to dig into ggplot if mode. Okay, sampling rows. So uh, we can also filter data at random into smaller data sets using sample n and sample fraction. If you think about it, all sampling observations from a data set is, is um, randomly filtering. So instead of saying, I want to filter on a variable, you say, just give me some random rows. It's still a filtering operation because you're picking out specific rows. So uh, what I'm going to do here, you'll see here I have a set C413. If you have some particular thing you're working on and you want to get the same random numbers every time you run it, you can set the seed. The seed here is just the thing that determines uh, the order random numbers are going to show up. Okay, uh, I'm not going to go on my a tangent about random numbers, but basically one of the only things computers can't do well is generate random numbers. Um, they aren't actually random, they're called pseudo-random numbers. Um, if you want to have more details about how this all works, you can do question mark set seed and allow your brain to catch on fire reading about these things uh, for R. Anyway. Um, if you're into cryptography or something, R uses a pretty standard Mersenne twister to generate random numbers. Okay, so anyway, I basically want to get the same numbers every time, so I set the C. I'm going to say, take the Yugoslavia data, and then sample N. Sample N is a way to get a number of random draws from your data. I say size 6, replacement false. This means I'm going to draw randomly out six rows from my Yugoslavia data without replacement. If you said replace true, you get the same row multiple times. If you say replace equals false, you can't get the same row multiple times. This here is just a random draw. You can see they're random. I've got two Bosnia Herzegovina, two Montenegros, one Slovenia, one Serbia. The years are all over the place because they're randomly drawn. This is just a quick way to draw random samples. If you're working with a really big data set and you're like fitting statistical models, if you've got like 10 million rows, statistical significance no longer matters anymore. Everything you test is gonna be significant. 
So for your models to go fast, just sample out like 10%, 5% of your data to run all your models until you're getting right to the end of it, then fit it with the whole data set, it will speed everything up, okay? So big data sets, it makes a lot of sense to sample things down, unless they're like panel data or something where you have to use stratified sampling, which you can do. Okay. Another common dplyr operation you're going to want to do is just arranging your data, putting your data in different orders for some display purpose, that is arranging it, okay? So filtering, right, adds or removes rows. Arranging just changes the order of the rows in the data set. So here I say, take the Yugoslavia data and then rearrange the data so that it is in, it is ordered by year, by descending population. The way a range works is it's gonna first order it by year. Once it's done reordering the data by year, it's then within each year going to arrange it by population in descending order. If I look down here at the data, you'll see all the years 1952, all observations here, then 1957. But if I go over to population, instead of starting at the low values, it starts at high values and works its way down until the lowest population country within 1952, and then it starts over at a high population in 57 and counts down. You can put an arbitrary number of variables here in a range. Variables like this will be done in ascending order, so it begins with the low values and goes to the high. If you want them in descending order, wrap it in the DSC function, and it will flip the order. This is how you would rearrange your data by some numerical or alphabetical variable. How to do descending population and descending year. You could put DESC around year, and if you wanted it to be ordered by population first, you could put descending first and year second. But if you do it by population first, the descending year won't do anything because the populations are categorical like, so you can't really sort, or not categorical, but numeric. Not likely to find two countries having the same population at the same time. It's only the first will matter. But yeah, DESC thrown in front of it would make it descending year. Sure. Yeah. If I, um, the first part of this function is like what you want to be arranged and the second part is how to arrange it? No, this is both how to arrange it. So um, the thing is, is the rows, I can't like, you. the rows are never allowed to be disconnected from any of the values in the variables. You wouldn't want to just rearrange year the year column because it wouldn't make any sense to flip the year of the observations around. This is, sort, is moving entire rows, depending on the values of year first, and then population. So it's first sorting the rows so that the year ascends from 1952 to 57, and then within the years so by descending population. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. And so the next question there, do I need to save this or is the working data frame now sorted? In R, the thing you are working on is never modified. So if you wanted to save these changes, you'd have to assign it back to the Yugoslavia object. R is a destructive language in that to make any changes to things, you have to overwrite things. Nothing you do is ever saved in place on objects without explicitly overwriting them, which is kind of nice. Okay, next thing. Um, maybe what I want to do is I want to pick specific columns, not specific rows. So we can limit the rows we have using filter, but we can also pick specific columns using select, which we can also reorder things. So here I say, take the Yugoslavia data and then select the columns, country, year, population, give me the first four observations. Well, now the data set just has country, year, and population. Okay, select lets us select specific variables. Anything you don't name gets thrown away. Okay, so it's the column version of filter. You'll notice we're not using logical statements for it, we're just naming the variables. It has a different syntax than filter. Uh, what's the function to arrange by ascending order? None. By default, variables are sorted by ascending order. So if you don't put descend, it's in ascending order. Next one. Uh, oh, can you specify a bit about the difference between distinct and select? Yes, let me illustrate. Let's go down here. Okay, 
If I say gapminder distinct continent year, it's only going to give me the observations like Asia 1952, Europe 1952 to These are the unique values of these things, right? There's exactly one observation for Africa in 2007 because there's only one, the unique instances are only these, right? The continents are, this is the unique observations of continent and year. If I say select, and you'll notice this is 60 rows, there are 60 unique combinations of continent and year in the data. But if I do select, I'm going to get the same columns, but I'm going to get 1,704 rows because it hasn't reduced the number of rows. That's the original number. It's just only given me the continent and year columns. And you'll see if I scroll through this, I've got lots and lots and lots and lots of repeated observations. I could find a whole bunch of America's 1992 in here because it's not the unique combinations. This is just the continent and year columns, whereas distinct is showing me the unique combinations of these things. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Distinct is good um, if you don't care about the other columns and you just want unique values of something. Like maybe I just want to know what continents there are in the data. You might say like just distinct continent. Now I see that there, these are the five continents in my data set. It's usually the kind of thing, uh, ah, great question. Is distinct different from unique? It's basically the same function, but unique can only be used on vectors. Distinct, you can give it a data frame and then select a column from it, and it produces a data frame as an output. So um, unique, I can do unique gapminder continent which produces a vector. I cannot do unique gapminder continent, gapminder year. It only checks the first thing here. It ignores the thing over here. The neat thing here is I can give an arbitrarily large number of variables and distinct works for factors. It works for literally anything you give it. So it's good for doing um, things that are distinct on multiple uh, dimensions or distinct in getting a data frame and return. In this case, you see it's multiple columns coming back. Uh, it's a data frame specific version of unique. What if I want to two, two columns, such as year and life expectancy? Enter, do you want to enter two in distinct? Because this is two different columns already. Three columns. Yeah, you can do as many as you want. Doesn't matter. Can you feed distinct a range for one of its columns? You need to filter first. You would, I would probably filter first. I don't think distinct can be specified a range. Uh, optional variables to use. No, it doesn't look like it takes a range. So you filter it first on whatever variable. Okay. Yeah, most of these things scale. You can just keep adding more arguments and they'll happily sort by whatever. You know, mostly they'll take an infinite number of arguments. Okay. So back to it. Um, select function in dplyr, as I just showed you, can be used to pick columns you want. It can also be used negatively. You can use it to drop columns you don't want. Here I say to the Yugoslavia data and then select minus continent minus pop minus life expectancy. I get country, year, and GDP per capita, which are the three columns I didn't subtract. Okay? So if you just want to get rid of a column, you can do minus that column. If you want to keep columns, you just specify them without a minus. You can't use both the minuses and the non-minuses because it doesn't make any sense. Um, but yeah, so sometimes you have a big data frame, you want to get rid of one column, use minus. It's easier than naming them all. Does that make sense? Okay, so select has a bunch of helper functions that make it easier to pick columns. So very often you're working, at least in my life, tragically, very often I'm working with really large data sets. So for instance, this little screenshot right here is from the Denver Youth Survey, a, a survey I help uh, do local administration for on campus. Um, it has, at last count, just under 90,000 columns. That is a lot of variables in a data set, 
and I don't want to name them all and select when I want to pick some columns. dplyr does not require you to do that. I can instead use these things called helper functions. For instance, in this data frame, I have the data organized such that all the variables that tell you whether a respondent was married at a given age, that is the age of 10, 11, 12, 13, in the sample there are people married at age 12, um, married at these particular ages. So because everything begins with married and ends with the age, I can do things like this. I could say if I want every variable in the DYS that regards marriage, I can say select every column that starts with the text married. This is gonna go and grab all the married columns, which go from 10 to 26, and it gives them all. I don't have to say, give me married 10, married 11, married 12, married 13. I can say, give me the ones whose variable names start with this. Maybe I'm doing an analysis only on the 18 year olds in the data. I could instead say, take the Denver Youth Survey and then select variables that end with 18, okay? And so because I sort of made the data so that every variable described with an 18 year old ends with 18, it gives me all of them. This is why you use good variable names in your data sets so that you can use selection helpers on them later. Courtney asks here, can R use wildcards like married star? Yes, using regular expressions, which we're gonna learn in week seven or week eight, week eight. Yeah, regular expressions are the ultimate form of using things like wildcards. They are the, the language, the logical language of language. Um, we'll get there. After week, this week three lecture, week eight is probably one of the most useful ones to social scientists because we're gonna talk about how to do text manipulation. But yeah, you have a massive amount of flexibility in selecting columns. Okay. Um, yeah, so there's a few of these different helpers. Starts with is really common, ends with, contains would look for the text anywhere in the name. There's also matches and matches uses regular expressions. Um, regular expressions are very powerful. You can do all sorts of weird and arbitrary things. Uh, there's no simpler ways than regex for simple needs. Uh, yeah, contains um, will basically does it. So if you just need to know like the text married, you can say contains married and it would give you all these ones even if they had some prefix before married. Contains is sort of the simpler version. Uh, but then you go straight to regex for anything particularly complicated. Um, IA in this class sort of um, highly suggests that people learn at least a little bit of regular expressions because it's once you've learned the basics, it's always the fastest way to do everything. And the basic, basic regular expressions are super easy once you learn like five characters. Um, yeah. Ah, that's a good question. What is start var, end var? So this is another way you can select things in dplyr. So if I look at the Gapminder data set, you'll see its columns are country, continent, year, life expectancy, population, GDP per capita. What if I wanted continent, year, life expectancy, and pop, the middle four? I could say select continent colon pop. And what it's gonna do is it's gonna select continent and population and everything between continent and population, which is year and life expectancy. This is a weird little shortcut, but it basically creates a series of variables beginning with this one and ending with this one. Yeah, it's another handy one. Uh, does starts with and ends with work with filter as well? No, it only works with select. If you want to see whether some text starts or ends with something, you'll use the string detect function, which I briefly showed earlier, but I'm also gonna introduce in week eight. Uh, does it select column numbers as well? I actually don't remember if select likes column numbers. It does, column one, column two. And so you could of course say column two through four. Uh, yeah. And contains is kind of weird. So I could say select EA, the only variable containing the text EA is year. Contains doesn't work in filter. You'd use string detect, which I'll introduce in week eight because it's substantially more complicated. Okay, I'm gonna keep chugging along. Lots of different ways to select variables. My recommendation is if you figure out something you wanna select and you can't figure out how to do it in like five minutes, email me, shoot the Slack channel, I'll tell you, and then you'll remember it later. Okay, so 
The neat thing about the select function, or a neat thing, is select can also be used to rename your columns. It doesn't just select things you can rename simultaneously. So I could say, take the Yugoslavia data, and then select the column life exp and rename it to be life expectancy. So the new name is on the left, the data you're getting to go in that column is on the right. So you're saying this thing here is named, is contains the stuff on the right. It's kind of like an assignment or an argument in a function. I get head four. This is the like the old life expectancy column, but it's been renamed. Okay. So you can rename things at the same time you select them. But the thing about select is it only keeps the columns that you ask for. If you just want to rename it and you don't want to also drop all the other columns, you want to use the rename function instead. Okay. So I say here, take the Yugoslavia data and then select country, year, and life expectancy. So this drops it down to these three columns and then just rename life expectancy or life exp to be life expectancy. Now I do have country, year, and life expectancy columns and only life expectancy has been renamed. Okay. So here's a good question. What's the difference between rename and mutate? On the surface, they look almost exactly the same and in fact can perform basically the same function um, in a narrow way. If you say mutate like life expectancy equals life exp, the only difference between rename and mutate is the life exp column will still exist when you mutate because you're creating a new variable based on it. Otherwise, it's exactly the same. So basically, this is really just copying the column to a new name and then deleting the old one. Technically speaking, that's exactly what it's doing, I think. Um, yeah, so if they look equivalent. The difference, of course, with mutate is you could do all sorts of other calculations, but this specifically can only be used to change the name of a variable without modifying it. Sometimes I actually just create, I'll kind of rename a variable like this in mutate because it's the first thing that popped out of my fingers when I started typing the code, but it's basically the same. Rename specifically for changing variable names though. So, some recommendations, some advice. Every once in a while, I insert tangents in my lectures to tell people to do things. Um, so, column naming practices. Good column names are self-describing. Do not use inscrutable abbreviations to save your typing. You have autocomplete functions in our studio, so use appropriately long variable names to at least understand what it is. Don't name everything in your data set V1 through V2640, which is the original format the Denver Youth Survey was in. Don't do that because it makes people like me manually rename all 2640 variables. Uh, question chat, once you rename it, you have to reference the new name moving forward. Yes, you do. After it's been renamed, it immediately, the old one is gone and you use the new name. It has no memory. R has no memory of anything. Once you make a change, it's done. Next, valid names in R for columns can contain upper or lowercase letters, numbers, periods, and underscores. The only re real restriction is that they must start with a letter or a period, and they can't be a reserved word like true in all caps or if. So Tristram, is rename destructive? Kind of. It basically has removed the old column and replaced it with an identical one with a new name. So from that way, it is kind of destructive. Uh, Next, names are case sensitive. Year with a capital Y and with a lowercase y are two completely different things. I recommend sticking to like all lowercase all the time just for ease. Uh, so yeah. Uh, next, you can include spaces or reserved words in your column names um, if you put back ticks around them. This can be nice if you want them to look nice in ggplot or pander and I'll show an example in a minute. So here's a great question. This is me mess messing with you with terminology. What is a naked column? A naked column name is just the column names as you've seen them in this class. A non-naked column name is what I'm gonna show you in a second when you put back ticks around it and you get to break all the rules. So you get to rebel against column name restrictions using back ticks. This is an example. So maybe what I want is I want my life expectancy column to have a space in its name. I can do that, but I can't do it with a naked variable name because if it sees a space, it thinks it's two objects, life and expectancy. So I'm a mess with it. So I say here, 
take the Yugoslavia data and then filter so that country is equal to Serbia. And I look just at Serbian life expectancy. I select only year and life expectancy. And then I rename year to be capital Y. So year goes to capital Y. Then I do some shenanigans. I'm taking my life expectancy column and I, you see I rename it in back ticks. So again, back ticks are above the tab key, below escape and to the left of the one key on your keyboard. And they're one of the most useful keys in R. R loves its back ticks. Same thing you use to create chunks, right? In your mark markdown. You can put anything you want in back ticks like this and it becomes a valid object name. You always will have to refer to it with the back ticks, but now you can do anything you want, okay? So now I've said, we're gonna create a new column or, or we're gonna rename life expectancy to be life space expectancy. I get head, I throw it to a pander table, and now look, the column has a space in it. This is a way to make things that format nicely in your tables without manually modifying the table. You can put spaces in and they'll display with a space. The only thing is you're gonna have to put the back ticks around the name. So when you ask what's a naked column name, this is a naked column name. This is a monstrosity that's wrapped in back ticks and you can make it anything you want. Back ticks give you some power. I recommend not doing this very often. Uh, so you don't have to write back ticks and, and occasionally our functions don't like it. Um, sometimes modeling functions don't like things with, space, with spaces in them, yeah. Yeah, yeah, there. Why do I not use the back ticks? Because I don't have to. If I put a space in here, it wouldn't work without the back ticks. That's all it is. These let me use spaces. They also let me do all sorts of other heinous things like name a variable all capitals true or name it a number or something like that. Yeah, all sorts of power. Ah, how is this different than quotes? It's completely different. So back ticks, this makes it an object. If I put it in quotes, it would be just some quoted text and the function would not work. Um, it's just the peculiarity. So here, if I go like this, uh, let's hope I've created this already. Okay, so I got life expectancy. If I, instead of back ticks, if I put this in quotes, what's it gonna do? Ah, okay, dplyr is smart. It knows that what I want is a variable name with, a, with uh, quotes in it, so it let me do it. R normally doesn't like doing that sort of thing. The appropriate way is to do it with back ticks here. Um, yeah. Here, if I put back ticks around it, it will change nothing. It will still be named year. But what the back ticks let me do is do something crazy. Like I could say instead of year, I could name this column seven and it would let me do it. Back ticks allow you to break every rule for column naming, just if you want to. I wonder if it'll let me do it with quotes. And it'll let me do it with quotes. Dplyr is wacky. Let's do all sorts of these weird things. Okay. Okay. Back ticks, though, are the appropriate R style way to do it. It looks like dplyr will let you do it with quotes, but that will break everywhere else except rename and mutate and stuff. Okay. So moving on, uh, in dplyr, we create new columns using mutate, as I keep saying over and over again. We can add new columns to a data frame with mutate. So for example, here, I'm gonna create a couple columns and you can create as many variables as you want in a single mutate column. So here I say, take the Yugoslavia data and then filter so that the country is Serbia and then select the year population and life expectancy columns and then mutate some new variables. I'm gonna create two variables. The first is I'm gonna create one called pop million. It's gonna be equal to population divided by one million. And then life expectancy past 40 is equal to life exp minus 40. I get a new population million column, which if you look 6.86 is this divided by a million. And life expectancy past 40 is just this number minus 40. So you can mutate and use some math to generate new column names. Okay? Or not column names, but new columns. You can do an arbitrary number of them in a mutate call. It's perfectly happy to make as many variables as you want. Ah, so this is an excellent one. And I was actually for speed gonna brush over, but it's a great question. Is there a story behind mutate? The name is not intuitive. Almost every other name in dplyr is an intuitive name. 
Mutate is only intuitive if you are already a programmer. Mutation in programming terms is a name specifically for um, modifying things in kind of in place, uh, mutating a value or something. Um, but that's something that only makes sense to computer scientists. So for some god awful reason, they stuck with mutate as a name for creating variable. I would have picked create or something like that, but mutate is what they picked. Um, I think part of it was because no mutate function existed in any other main heavily used package and all the other things they could think about already existed. So they picked mutate. It is to me one of the least intuitive names, but you'll use it enough. You'll never forget. It. Okay. Mm -hmm. When you mutate variables, it will keep the previous columns. If you don't want to keep the previous columns, you can do transmutate or transmute sorry, transmute. Transmute will drop everything not created in it. I've never used transmute, but it exists. Okay. A common thing you'll want to use in mutate and in general in R programming is the function if else. And I'll quickly say if else is not the same as if and else in general programming. I'll show you those in a couple weeks. Uh, but if else is a specialty function that returns a vector of values depending on a logical test. Its syntax looks like this. If else, some particular test is true, return this value. If this test is false, return this other value. This is an abstract example, which is not very informative, so I'm going to show you how it works. Here's an example. Let's say I have a vector I create. This vector contains the number one, the number zero, a missing value. NA in all caps is a missing value, and a negative two. So I say, if else, example is greater than zero, return positive. If not, return not positive. So what if else does is it works its way down this vector running this test. So first it says, okay, let's test example. Is the number one, the first value of example, greater than zero? Oh, it's greater than zero. So we return positive. Then it says, is zero greater than zero? False. So it returns not positive. Is a missing value greater than zero? Well, it's missing, so I can't do the test. So it returns a missing value. Okay. If you use an NA in any kind of a logical test, it returns an NA because you can't test against a missing value. And then it looks at is negative two, is negative two greater than zero? It's not, so it returns not positive. So if else, what it's doing is it's running down uh, all of this vector, doing this test one element at a time. Anytime it's true, it returns this. Anytime it's false, it does this. Great question. What are the differences in utilization of if else and case when? I'm going to show you case when in a second. Case when is just a way to do multiple if else statements in a row. So it's actually the exact same thing. Case when is my favorite function in dplyr and is tremendously powerful. I'll show it there. So two slides ahead. Okay. Here's an example of using if else to perform a common operation. So I have had to say in this lecture, Bosnia and Herzegovina far too many times. So to avoid saying Bosnia and Herzegovina again, I'm going to replace it with B and H. So I'm going to take my Yugoslavia data and then mutate a new variable. This variable is going to be called short country. Short country is going to be equal to the result of an if else statement. The statement is based on this test. If country is equals to Bosnia and Herzegovina, if else should return B and H. If it is not equal to Bosnia and Herzegovina, return to me the value of country. Country, however, is a factor, and so I'm going to convert it to character data. Okay, I'll show you why, why, why you do that in a second. Then I'm going to select just country, short country, year, and population, arrange them by year and short country. We see this if else statement has taken Bosnia and Herzegovina, and for the short country variable, made it just B and H. But because I've said if, it's, if country is not Bosnia and Herzegovina, just give me the original value of country. Croatia is still Croatia, Montenegro is still Montenegro. It only modified this. 
So this if else statement here is a way to change one value in a variable. I essentially wanted to have only Bosnia Herzegovina shortened down and leave everything else alone. The question here is what is C over here? What is C here? C is the function for combine. It combines these numbers into one vector. C is used for creating vectors. We're going to spend a lot of time with C in next week. Okay, far too much time with it. Okay, so yeah, this is a way to modify one essentially value in something. So uh, the idea here is country is a factor and I have to use it, convert country uh, using as character. If I don't do that, I'm gonna get some funky result, which I'll explain later in the class. So if I do this, we'll see Bosnia Herzegovina turns to B and H over here. Watch what happens if I don't do as dot character. Notice how for Croatia, it's the number 32. Whereas before, if I do as dot character, Croatia is Croatia. The reason is factors are weird. Um, if you convert a uh, factor to a character uh, variable without using as dot character, it takes its numeric level because factors are a categorical variable with an underlying numeric value. This just prevents it from doing that. Just know you have to do it. We'll explain the arcane reasoning of it in next week. So for all these things, these changes don't apply to the original data frames. We'd have to include them in every pipe in our code if we want to keep these in. Yes, or assign them back to the object. If I wanted this to be permanent, I could do Reassign, reassign it back to Yugoslavia and it will make the changes permanent. Now, if I access the Yugoslavia object, it permanently has short country in it. So as a matter of code hygiene, what do I do? Well, it depends. Uh, if I want to use the object over and over again with those changes, I'll make an object. If I'm gonna use them once, I just do the pipe chain and don't save it. So it just depends what I'm gonna do. I like making as few objects as possible, which you can probably tell immediately if you look at my current global environment. I've done a lot of examples already this lecture and I have one object in my global environment. That's me. I believe in a certain um, monk-like purity of global environments. I must have as few as possible. And once I start to get more than five, I become uncomfortable. Yeah. I just try minimal objects. But you do you. There's no reason not to have tons of objects in your environment. It doesn't hurt anything unless you have big data, um, which is funny. I, I like few objects, but I've got like 64 meetings on my workstation, so it's not like I'm about to run out of memory anytime soon. Anyway, keep churning along. See you. Time is at 4:40. Okay, we gotta keep moving. Okay. Recode is a function that could do the same sort of operation I just did, but it works on factors. Recode is really helpful to use inside mutate if you want to change one particular level or value of a factor and keep it as a factor. I could say, take the Yugoslavia data and then mutate so that country, notice I'm overwriting the original country variable here. You can do that in mutate. Country equals, we're going to recode a variable. We're going to recode the country variable, taking Bosnia and Herzegovina, and turning it into B and H. This is the syntax for recode. The old value comes first, the new value comes second. It's the only damn place in dplyr that has that order, but that's just the way to do it. I have no idea why they haven't changed it. And then I'm also gonna recode Montenegro to be M because I be like that. Now, if we look and I get distinct values of country, Bosnia and Herzegovina is now B and H, Croatia is the same, Montenegro is M, Serbia and Slovenia are unchanged. It's still a factor. So if you're working with factors and you want to modify levels, recode is the easiest way to do it. Okay. Recode is actually a base R function technically, which is why the order is that way. Could I do this with an if statement, like change B and H uh, only if the year is 1950? Yes, and you could do it right here. You would say country equals equals Bosnia Herzegovina and year equals equals 1950, and then it would only change it for that exact period. 
So if else, you could have an arbitrarily large number of these uh, conditional statements. It's perfectly happy. Okay, turning along. Now, as was anticipated, uh, are these two ways to do the same thing? Yes, they are two different ways to do the same thing. I would use recode if you wanted to stay a factor um, and you understand the recode syntax. Otherwise, I would use if else. The more things you're going to change, the easier it is to use recode. But they're basically equivalent. I sometimes like to show multiple ways to do things, because why not? Here's yet another way we could do basically the same thing, but this is the most powerful of all of them. Case when, the most powerful function. Case when is a dplyr function for performing multiple sequential if else statements. It does them, it says here at the same time, but actually they're sequential. This is a good way to create a new variable based on many different tests. Here's an example. What I want to do is I want to generate an ordinal measure of GDP per capita, which is just going to be high, moderate, and low GDP per capita. I'm going to use some rules to do that. I say, take the Gapminder data and then mutate GDP per capita ordinal, my new measure, is equal to case when. And then in case when, I have lots of statements. I say, if GDP per capita is less than 700, assign to GDP per capita ordinal low. So the tilde here is a, signifies a formula. If this statement is true, assign this value to the new variable. Okay, if this statement is false, it goes to the next line. So it goes down here. So let's say GDP per capita is actually 900. This is going to return a false, so it goes here. Now it's going to say if GDP per capita is greater than or equal to 700 and below 800, so if it's between 700 and 800, assign moderate. But let's say it's 900. This returns a false, so it goes down to the next row. This is just true. This is true no matter what. So if this is false, this is false, any value that remains is going to get assigned a high. Okay. So if I look at my data, having done this, Afghanistan is a great example because its income hits all of those categories in this year span. I can say its GDP per capita was 786. Well, that is above 700, but below 800, so it got a value of moderate. And then its GDP per capita was 978, which is above 800, so it got all into this last line and got a high. 852 gets a high, and then its GDP per capita dropped a lot down here in 1992 to 649, which is below 700, so it gets a low. So the way case when works is it checks this one, if it, if it gets a true here, it assigns this value and doesn't check the remaining ones. Otherwise, it just works its way down until it encounters a true. So here's a question. If you have NAs in your data frame, will dplayer automatically keep it as an NA? It used to be that case when would kick an error if it encounters an NA, but I believe now it will just leave it as an NA. But I'm not 100% sure. Um, I usually explicitly handle NAs. So if you thought there were going to be NAs in this statement, I would do it like this. I believe firmly in explicitly handling NAs always. If you think you've got missing values, handle them manually so you know what happened to them. But you could say if uh, GDP per capita, if GDP per capita is NA, uh, assign an NA to it. Uh, so I could say here, this is a test, is.na returns a true if this variable is na, otherwise it returns a false. I would assign to it an na. Notice here, I say na underscore character underscore. This is an na, a missing value, but it's specifically a character missing value. Case when prefers you to specifically type your nas. So you can do like, is it a missing character value? A, you can't do numeric, but you can do, what is it, NA, what are the other NA options? Ah, right, NA real number for reals and things. If you have problems with this, just shoot me a, uh, a message. It's kind of an arcane thing. Uh, so what does case one do for unspecified values? Uh, so if it runs down and, and you, you have some condition that's non-specified, uh, 
I actually don't know what it does by default. So what would happen if I just say, let's remove this true over here and see what it does. It's going to have to be none in a character. Just returns an NA. So if it's non-exhaustive and it makes it through, it returns an NA. Which thing did I say it prefers? The character. If I do uh, NA real here, it's going to say uh, it can't do it because there's a conflict between types. So this is a real number missing value, and this is a character missing value. Um, these type of data have to match. All the different outputs for the given column in case one have to match in type. So if, the, if you're using character data like this, this also needs to be character to work. This is an annoying thing about case one, but it's actually a good programming practice to uh, make sure your data types match. Okay, if you have problems with it, shoot me a message. It's better to experiment with it and see if you run into trouble than try and memorize these rules. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, one time when I was using case one to try to relabel um, values in, in one of my columns, um, I, it would spit out NAs if I didn't like revalue every single um, value within that column. Yeah. To do it, the if else statement um, where you can type in like as dot character country and it'll spit out the rest of the values in the column without having to like reiterate, say like, you know, if I were to change in this data set Asia back to Asia. Yeah. Uh, So the thing with case when is, so if you want to change a value but leave the rest the same, you could do something like, um, you'd essentially want to do, like, let's say I want to change GDP per capita to uh, low if it's below 700, but if not, I want to keep the same value. If GDP per capita, otherwise um, I could just say, Do something like that, um, but it does have to, you know, here now it's going to be low GDP if the number is below that, but otherwise the number that would be the way to to change. Essentially, it's the equivalent of changing a specific value. I basically changed all the below 700s to be low and kept all the rest of them the same. That'd be the way I'd do it in case when. Um, but normally I wouldn't use case when for it because it's kind of like using an overpowered tool for it if else would work. Yeah. Okay, we keep jogging along done enough tangents here that we're running terribly low on time. Okay, uh, here's a handy function I've used in lab. Sometimes you want to extract a single column from your data frame as a vector after doing a bunch of commands. Pull will extract a column of a data frame as a vector. So if I say gapminder and then pull life expectancy, it comes out as a vector of life expectancy. So it extracts the column and instead of popping out as a data frame, it pops out as a vector. If I say gapminder and then select life expectancy, you'll see it comes out as a column in a table. The only difference between these, it's the exact same data. This one is a data frame, this one is a vector. If you need a vector for some reason, use the top one with pull. Just remember that exists. Uh, this is really handy for doing inline statements. If you're interested in this, revisit it. I'm actually gonna skip over it because this is rarely used. Um, but just know if you wanna do inline statements, pull is really handy for it. Okay, now I wanna to get to summarizing because we might run out of time. So summarizing data with dplyr. <clears throat> so the function in dplyr summarize, not to be confused with summary, which is built into R, summarize takes the columns of your data and compute something using every single row you give it. You might do things like count how many rows there are, calculate the mean of columns, the sum of columns, their minimum and maximum values. You can use and summarize any function that aggregates multiple values into a single value. Standard deviation, mean, maximum, median, all those things take multiple values and make one out of them so they can be used and summarize. Here's an example. So let's say for the year 1982, we want to get all those things I mentioned in the last slide for Yugoslavia. I'm going to say here, take the Yugoslavia data and then filter to 1982 and then summarize these data. Let's get the number of observations. I'm going to say n obs is equal to 
again, this is a specialty function in dplyr. This tells you how many observations there are in the current data set. Okay. Total population is going to be equal to the sum of the population column. Mean life expectancy is the average of the life expectancy column. And the range of life expectancy is equal to the highest value minus the lowest value. So it's the difference between the high and the low. Summarize is going to produce one row as a result. It takes all of the observations I have. In this case, there were five observations, which is the number of observations. It combined all five of them together and summarized them to get a single row of data. This is the total population for all five Yugoslavian countries in 1982. This was their average life expectancy, and this was the range between their highest and lowest life expectancy. So Summarize calculated these new variables using every row in the Yugoslavia data set in 1982, because I filtered it down. So Summarize takes lots of rows and collapses them down into fewer rows. Okay, It's for aggregating. Okay. If you want to aggregate and create many similar variables at the same time, as in you want to summarize like all the variables in your data set, there's a shortcut function for summarize. This shortcut is called across. Maybe what I need to do is calculate the mean and standard deviation for lots of columns in my data frame. I can use across to do it, and I'll show you how. Take the Yugoslavia data, and then filter so that year is 1982 as I did before, but then I'm going to say, and then let's summarize across these variables. So I have to give it a vector of variable names. So C creates a vector. The variables are life expectancy and population. That's all that goes in this vector. Then I have to provide a list of variables of things I want to calculate. I say the list is going to be I want the average variables to be equal to this formula. This is tilde, remember, is a formula. This says I want to calculate average to be equal to the mean of period. You're like, what is period? Period, kind of like in the pipe earlier, is a thing that says put something here. The thing that's going to go here is life expectancy is going to go there, and then population is going to go there. Same thing, SD is equal to this formula, SD, period. So this statement here says, for life expectancy and population, I want to calculate new columns where life expectancy goes into the mean and the standard deviation, and population goes into the mean and the standard deviation. What do we get as a result? I get life exp underscore average. So what it did is it took the name of this variable, added an underscore, and then took the name of the function that I ran on it, this mean naming, this mean function average. And then it did it for standard deviation, too. So it took life expectancy and did two things to it, and then population and did two things do it. So this is the mean of life expectancy, its standard deviation, the mean of population, and its standard deviation. I could do this for an arbitrarily large number of variables and an arbitrarily large number of functions. This is an excellent question in chat. What is list? List is a ubiquitous R function we're going to cover in detail next week. It's for creating lists. Lists are an object type. Much like vectors over here are an object type, lists are also a type of object. They're just a more powerful and flexible type of object that can, for instance, contain a function as one of their elements. We're going to spend too much time with lists next week, uh, but just Look at the syntax and use it, and let the intuition roll over you, and then later we'll see how weird this is. This is how I tend to like introduce things in this class. Show you something weird, don't tell you too much how, much we how weird it is, and then later let it break your brain after you're used to using it. Okay, so here's a question. How is a cross different from group by before summarize? Ah, so I'm gonna show you group by in a second. A cross says, perform these operations across these variables. Group by says, perform these operations within the values of a particular variable. So this is going over the columns. Group by is actually going over the rows. Okay. So if I don't put the tildes here, this will break. The tildes are actually necessary here. It's the syntax for it. Uh, you could, however, say list, I think just mean, comma, SD, and it would work. 
But this formula lets me do additional arguments inside these functions, which I'll show in a, uh, maybe in another example either today or in a couple weeks. Okay. So for now, just put them there. Test what happens if you don't. <clears throat> okay. If I had more time, I'd stop for these tangents better, but I want to try and get through it and we have a lot to go. Okay. So uh, I'm actually going to skip this, but basically the idea is, if you're in a situation like this where you have lots of parentheses nested and you start to get confused, break them up into their own lines and sometimes it becomes more readable. But I'm going to skip over this because I'm spending too much time saying things. Okay, so there's additional ways using a cross to perform repetitive operations. So instead of naming the variable specifically, I could say, for instance, summarize across everything and that will summarize and do this to every variable in your data set okay so this is a nice shortcut maybe every variable in your data set is numeric i could just say go across everything if there's a hundred variables in the data set this would summarize every single one of them producing a mean and an st column for it similarly maybe you have a data set that has some character data and numerics and you just want to summarize the numeric data i could say take my data frame and then summarize across the variables where they are numeric. Where allows you to specify inside of it some test function. Test functions include is.character, is.numeric, is.factor, things like that. This basically says anytime you find a numeric column, do this summary operation. This would pull out only the numeric columns in your data set and then run the summary on them. These are things I would experiment with. I don't have examples of them because they're kind of niche applications, but know that much like how you can do specialty selection in the select function, that stuff all works in summarize across also. Okay. Uh, now I want to talk about group by, which was brought up a second ago. The function group by is a special function that changes how other functions afterward work on your data. Most importantly, the summarize function. Functions run after group by are computed within the groups defined by the variables you group on. Um, this is equivalent and is used to do operations like pivot tables in Excel. I'll show you. So for example, maybe instead of filtering down to the year 1982 in Yugoslavia, I want to compute year by year summaries of the Yugoslavian data. I could say, take the Yugoslavia data and then group by year, and then summarize. I'm going to get the number of countries is equal to the distinct number of countries. It's going to be the same as doing n, but it shows you n distinct counts the number of unique uh, observations. Total population is the sum of population. Total GDP per capita is the sum of population times GDP per capita divided by total population. Uh, then this is what I get down here. <clears throat> You'll notice because I grouped by year, I get one row for every year in my data set. So this makes my summarize no longer produce a single row, but one summary for everything I grouped on. So we see there were always five countries every year in Yugoslavia, but the total population was steadily growing across all these years, and so was GDP per capita. This is like pivot tables in Excel. You can kind of group on something and perform summary calculations across your data. This is one of the most powerful dplyr operations because, for instance, maybe you've got a whole bunch of individual person data. Maybe individuals are nested in, I don't know, neighborhoods. And what you actually care about is the averages in the neighborhoods. You could group on your neighborhood indicator and summarize all your individual data. Now you have a data set at the neighborhood level instead of the individual. You might encounter lots of different types of data sets that you actually want some aggregation of. This lets you summarize or aggregate your data to any arbitrary grouping thing. Summarize is incredibly powerful when used with group by. Okay. Uh, yeah, so that's how that works. Other things that are useful in uh, dplyr, mutate, and summarize are window functions. Window functions are special types of functions that operate within a window or a segment of your data, usually determined by a group, to calculate special things like lagged values, cumulative sums, or rank orders. To get more on them, you can link to this vignette on window functions, but here's an example. 
Maybe what I want to do is I want to calculate population change year to year in these data. I say, take the Yugoslavia data and then select country year and population, filter only to the year 2002 and higher. So there's two years, 2002 and seven. Group by country. So within each country, I'm going to create some variables. The lag of population is equal to lag population ordered by year. Lag just gets the previous row's value of something. Order by says make sure they're in ascending year order. So it kind of arranges the data first and then gets this as last year's population or the previous year's population. Then calculate population change is the difference between the current year's population and last year's population. Let's look at what the data are. So lag just gets the previous row's value. So here, for instance, lag of population for this observation is 4,165,000. Is 4, it's just the previous year's population. This is the population column. Lag population, you'll see, is just the previous year's population. Lag just goes and gets the next value up of that variable. So instead of giving me population, it gives the next one up. You can do lag with multiple values and go further back, but this just says, give me the last one. It's kind of a handy function. Then I calculate population change is the difference between current population and last year's or 2002's population. The thing is, is because I calculated this within the countries, there is no lag population for 2002 because what it does is it first makes sure we're in the Croatia country it looks up and it sees population here, but this is in a different country. So it doesn't go and grab the lag of population from the wrong country. This is a window function because by grouping by country, lag is only willing to look within the same country and not do something stupid, which is go get another country's population value from the wrong year by looking up the table. So group by before you do something like calculate a lag. Uh, yes, this in chat. Do you organize order by year in case your data isn't organized by ascending year? Exactly. If my data were arranged some other way, I'd want to make sure the lag was grabbing the correct row. So I organized it by year. I could equivalently have arranged by year first and then mutated and I would have gotten the same result. Okay. Window functions, they're good for doing lags and stuff, cumulative sums, things like that. This is the kind of thing refer back to, don't need to memorize. Okay. So I'm somehow in 15 minutes going to talk about merging data. So let's see how fast I can get through this without being spitting out complete gibberish. If I have to, I'll start off the next uh, lecture with. Okay. So when do we need to join tables? Um, it's pretty common to need to merge data together. One of the most common things is that when you need to make some new variables that are too complicated to make in your main data set, so you do an extraction of some columns, do some operations, and join them back to your data. I do this a lot for really complex variable creation. Another one is you've got data stored in separate data sets to begin with. An example is I got hired by the university a while back to match University of Washington student and faculty registrar data to police stop records to do a bias and policing report for the university. These things had no logical connection between them, so I had to merge them based on people's names and some other demographic information. These are separate data sets. Sometimes you got to do merges. Um, oftentimes also like big surveys will be broken into many different data sets, one for each level, like households with individuals nested in them and the households are in neighborhoods or cities or something. You got to merge them together to do something with them. Merging is one of the most important skills in data manipulation. If you ever go into the private sector or anything, you're going to be expected to know how to like, merge data together. You'll probably use SQL to do it, but still merging. Yeah, if you're working with relational databases, SQL is all about merging tables. In fact, everything you're doing is basically merging tables most of the time. Okay, so these are the same terms. If you know anything about relational databases and using uh, structured query language, you're going to be very familiar with the terms I'm going to use here in a second. When you need to merge some data, generally you're merging, let's say, data frame A with data frame B. You got to ask yourself some questions. They are, which rows do I want to keep from A and B, that is each data frame? Which columns do I want to keep from each of them? And how do I want to determine matches between A and B? You don't want to make a match until you know the answer of all three of these questions. But if you do, you're ready to go. Okay, so this big slide is a way to tell you there's a lot of different types of joins you can do with dplyr. 
If you're familiar with SQL, you know all these terms already. These are all the same types of joins people commonly do in uh, SQL using relational databases. The language is the same because SQL is the master language of joining tables. So why reinvent the wheel? Take the lessons from SQL. So there's a million types of join, but nine times out of 10, a left join probably does the job you want. What a left join does is it say, if I go take table A and then left join it to table B, it will keep every row in the first table matched with B wherever possible. So it will get all the rows from B that have a match in A and it will keep columns from both of them. So what happens is you will keep every single row from A, but you will only get the rows from B that have a match in A. So it will discard anything in B that doesn't match. Right joined is the opposite. It keeps every column from both of them, but it throws away rows in A that don't match rows in B. Inner join keeps only the rows that there's a match on both sides. So any row in A that doesn't match one in B gets thrown away. Any row in B that doesn't match one in A gets thrown away. Full join keeps every row no matter what. And then there's some weird ones. Semi-join. Semi-join will keep all the rows from A that match the rows in B, but doesn't actually take any columns from B. This is basically a way to do a merge style filter of your data. And then anti-join keeps only the rows from A not found in B. This is a way to get rid of duplicate records between two tables, okay? You don't need to memorize these. You can use this as a reference if you want. Nine times out of 10, you either want a left join or a full join. If you're gonna remember any of them, remember left join, okay? So, when you say you want things to match, you need to provide some criteria for matching, okay? We list these in the joins with a argument to buy. So we would say buy equals something. If you're matching data frame A to data frame B, and you just wanna match on every column that has the same name, you don't have to say anything. If you don't provide a buy equals argument, it looks for columns with the same name and matches on them. <clears throat> If you have, um, say, uh, uh, only certain variables you want to match between A and B, like there's many columns with the same names, but you only want to match on some of them, you can name those columns. You can say, I want to match on variable one, variable two, and variable three. So you'd say by equals variable names. Maybe they have different names between the tables. So the variable you want to match in table A to in table B, they have different names. You'd say, this is the name of the variable in table A. I want to match to this variable in B. And you could do it for multiple ones. I usually prefer to just rename the variables in the two data frames to be the same and then match without worrying about it. But sometimes if I want to save a line of code, I do it this way, okay? Now, if there are multiple matches, you will get one row for every possible combination of matches um, between your data frames. Normally, this is what you want. But if you accidentally do something crazy, you could res result in many, many rows in your data frames, po possibly even what is referred to as a Cartesian join. A Cartesian join is when you match every row in a data set to every row in another data set which results in an exponential increase in the number of uh, rows. Do not match like a 1,000 length table to another 1,000 length table every single one because you will get a number of rows equal to 1,000 squared rows. This can slow your computer down a lot. So be careful when you do uh, joining operations. I've had a few of my students not able to figure out on their homework assignment, which you're gonna get this week, uh, why it just seemed like it would start running and then their computer would crash after five minutes and it was because it was eating up 16 gigs of RAM trying to join their tables together. Be very careful with joins. Okay, so let's put this stuff into action. So the data set I'm gonna use as an example is the data sets you're gonna use for your homework. You're going to install the package NYC Flights 13, which is sort of an interesting package. If you load it in library, it includes five data frames of data instead of one. It's every flight 
that flew out of JFK, LGA, or EWR airports in New York State, or sorry, New York City in 2013. Okay, so this is every flight. This is every airline abbreviation linked to the name of the airline. This is metadata on the airports, like their location and things. Airplane metadata, because every plane flies multiple flights per year, so you got data on the planes. And hourly weather data for each airport, okay? So the thing is, these are five different data frames. If you want to load them in your environment to look at them, you got to do data flights, data airlines, data airports, and load them separately, because they're five different data frames. Because they're five different data frames that share some common identifiers, we can join them together. Okay, here's an example. Um, so maybe you have some questions about these airline data. Let's answer a few of them. Here I'm going to say, I want to know who manufactures the planes that flew to Seattle from New York. So I say, take the flights data frame and then filter these data so that the destination equals Seattle and then select just the tail number. The tail number is a unique identifier for planes. It's all I care about in this case. I want to say what planes flew to Seattle. And then I left join these data to another data frame. The frame I'm joining them to is the planes data set, but I select the tail number and manufacturer because I only care about who manufactured the planes and the tail number because I need to use that to join it to the flights data frame. I then say I'm going to join by the tail number of the plane. So you notice here, I did a little bit of modification of my data inside of the left join. You can do a chain of pipes like this inside another function. It will run this whole statement and use that as this argument to left join. It's a way to write slightly tighter syntax. Then all I do here is say, count the manufacturers. This is count the number of flights by each manufacturer. This is a shortcut dplyr variable that will essentially summarize your data and just return a count of the values of each of these variables. And I arrange it by descending n. So what count does is it goes and finds how many rows in the data there are, have each value of the manufacturer variable. And then it compresses my data down to just the unique values of manufacturer and the number of rows that have that manufacturer. So we see here, that 2,659 flights from New York were in planes manufactured by Boeing, 475 by Airbus, 395 by also Airbus, but spelled differently, Airbus Industries, 391 unknown manufacturers, and then a couple small planes by Barker Jack and Cirrus. Okay, so this answered a quick question. Who manufactures the planes that flew to Seattle? By merging together two data sets. Okay. You could copy this code here and see how it works uh, as you're working on your homework and play with it. Okay. Here's another example. Maybe my question is, which airlines had the most flights to Seattle from New York City? It's a similar operation, but using different data. Now on the carriers. I say take the flights data set, again filter it down to flights to Seattle. But now I only care about the carriers. The carriers are like Delta and United and other, other carriers that are terrible to fly on. And then I'm going to join this to my airline's data by the carrier, because the common columns between flights and airlines are the carriers running the flights. Okay? I group it on the name of the carrier. And so if you want to see these columns, you can just pop open the data frames and look at them. I didn't show them for speed, but you can just look at them. Then I tally, doing group by name and then tally. These two lines are the same as doing count name. So I just want to show you another way to do this. What this is going to do is it's going to count the number of observation, unique observations uh, for each name that is each uh, carrier in the data. A range again by descending in. We see there were 1,213 flights by Delta from New York to Seattle, over 1,000 for United, this many for Alaska, JetBlue, and American. Okay, so this is sort of a quick way to get this sort of answer. Who had the most flights to Seattle? The answer in 2013 was Delta. Okay, keep on churning. We're almost done. <clears throat> Next one. 
Maybe you want to know if there's a relationship between departure delays and wind gusts. So all these questions I'm sort of asking are example things you could also do in your homework. Okay. For this, I want to plot the results. So I'm going to load up ggplot. Then I do something a little bit more complicated. The thing is, is I want to look at departure delays and wind gusts. Well, departure delays are specific to flights and wind gusts are weather data, which is the hourly data. So I can get the wind gusts at the exact hour of departure for these planes. And I have to merge on more variables. I say take the flights data and then select the origin variable, which is the specific airport, the year, which doesn't matter, they're all 2013, but I put it there anyway, the month, the day, the hour of the flight, and then I want the departure delay so I can check this in a minute. I'm going to join these data with an inner join to weather. Inner join will drop any observations from either the weather data frame or the flights data frame that don't have a match. So this basically gets rid of missing values on my weather data. I'm going to join to the weather data by the specific airport, because each airport has different weather, by the year, the month, the day and the hour of the flight because the weather is specific down to the hour. Okay, then the only thing I care about is the departure delay of the flight and how fast the wind was at the time. I actually don't care about the rest of that. I then remove any missing values for wind gusts or departure delay. So what this actually says is filter such that if departure delay is missing, that is, is NA departure delay, this would normally return a true. But remember in filter, it drops falses and keeps trues. If I put an exclamation point in front of it, it flips all the trues to falses and all the falses to true. This is a way to say, give me everything that is not missing on both of these variables. Okay, I can explain that later in like lab or, or via uh, email if people are more curious about it, but I only have a couple minutes. Then I do a quick plot of wind gusts by departure delays and put a smooth line through it. Okay, I immediately see a problem. So the thing was in the original version of these data, not the one that you will have if you download it, but in the original version of these, there was an error. So if you look over here, because none of these airports are on Venus, it is highly unlikely there were actually any 1200 mile per hour winds. So the 1200s over here are an obvious error in my data, okay? So we see some relationship, but it's all being driven by 1200 mile per hour Venusian winds. So let's fix that real quick. This is just an example of showing an iterative process. If you see something wrong on your plot, fix it and redo it. So I said, my wind gust should probably be under 250. I forget if it's miles per hour or KPH actually. Doesn't matter either way, Venus. Redo the plot. I hide the dots here and just show this one. This basically shows that there is a positive relationship between wind gusts here and average departure delay. Kind of dips here for some bizarre reason and then goes up, but generally there's a positive relationship. Okay? It's the kind of thing you might want to do. You'll do at least one plot in your homework. Okay. I'm going to skip over these if you're interested in suggestions of things to look at, because you could literally do exactly these things in your homework if you're not feeling creative. Uh, you can look at this, but the homework itself, because we're exactly at 520, just pick some things to look at in this NYC Flights 13 data, write up another RMD. This is the last free form homework in this class. After that, they're going to be templates, which we'll kind of walk through on labs and stuff. Again, upload your RMD and HTML file just at least once use each mutate, summarize, and group by, and any one join, left join, inner join, whatever you want to use. Include at least one nicely formatted ggplot and one nice table using pander or whatever other table if you're already familiar with somebody else like uh, cable or gt or something, feel free to use it. Use nice variable names. Maybe try out putting spaces in your variable names. Round your values to small. This time, do not hide your code. Use echo equals true in every single chunk to show all the code you ran so people can, at first glance, just immediately see all your dequire syntax. Um, try and make it look kind of nice. Maybe include some comments and separate stuff out so it's easy for people to read. Um, write some stuff up in words, but take it easy. You know, a sentence or something like that is plenty enough. 
Um, and again, as a reminder, if you want to see the NYC Flights 13 data in the environment, you'll want to do like data flights, data airlines, data airports, and do them individually because they're all separate data. Okay. That's what I got for today. Sorry to run a minute over and have to rush through some stuff. Happy to stick around and answer questions though. Anybody got anything? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, let me scroll up and get this one that's uh, right here. A little chunk here. Grab that. Okay, let me see that one. So if we have Gapminder loaded up, this is US Canada. This is US Canada 1982 to 2007. Oh, you like to convert to a bar chart instead of a line graph. Oh, the thing you're saying earlier. Right, 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 right. Okay, so what I will do here is I will instead say, uh, so you probably want to, okay, let's say GM call uh, position equals dodge. Uh, let's say bill equals country. And then what we actually want to do is we want to group on the years instead. So I'm going to say, want to group on the year. It's not exactly what I want here. Uh, <clears throat> group on year and well, actually, honestly, the easiest thing to do is to, uh, oh, wait, which ones do you want side by side? Do you want the two countries side by side? Or do you want all the years in a row side by side? Like you want the United States on the left, Canada on the right, two countries totally separate. Now, ah, well, the easiest thing to do there is to, uh, um, so not group on year, but uh, let's go. Discrete value supplied to continuous scale. Oh, because you've got uh, Now let's go with, uh, <clears throat> what else do we want to do? Oh, this, this should work without me doing factor. There we go, okay. Yeah, it is something like that. Um, you might want to give them like an outline or something like that to make it a little easier to see, but I mean, bar, a column chart like this is gonna be, um, oh, so you wanted like, so you want like the year, the two countries next to each other by year by year by year by year. Like that. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, so basically the idea here is that um, the, the thing that's gonna like kind of run left to right year like here, I give it X year, by grouping on country, it's going to, within the countries, break them up into their own uh, bars. But if I don't have position dodge here, it's gonna stack them on top of each other. If I do position dodge, instead of stacking them, it puts them next to each other. <clears throat> yeah, okay. Next question there, is case one similar to ifs in Excel? Uh, probably. Um, I've never actually used that in Excel, um, but that's probably, I mean, case is essentially multiple if statements, uh, case when, so yeah, probably is equivalent. I'd have to see the exact syntax for it. What's really funny is quite a while ago, I actually um, uh, lost a, or failed to get a job doing essentially data analytical work for the state of Oregon, because I didn't know how to run a pivot table in Excel, but I did of course know how to do like substantial data programming, but they're like, well, he doesn't know how to use Excel, so he doesn't know anything. That's, many years that's later, pretty hilarious. Yeah. Many years later, thankfully I'm here. Everything is much better. I have a job at Oxford coming up. I'm doing much better than I would have been doing. So life is good. So. Uh, next one says, I'm throwing an error when I wrote code from slide 30, could not find function across. Ah, so 
And I did load both the dplyr and tidyverse libraries. Do you have a, when, when did you install dplyr? It's a good question. Uh, you, last year sometime. Yes. So Across did not exist then. Gotcha. So I keep my class cutting edge and Across appeared in the most recent full dplyr release, which only really went full, I think, for this last spring. Um, yeah, I okay. try to be massively up to date. So most likely you just need to update probably dplyr and also your R by then because we're in R 4.0 now. Mm -hmm. Okay, so install about packages or something or an update through R2. Yeah, so the thing is, is you want to check on your version of R too, because um, uh, if you haven't updated in that long, you probably have 3 point, uh, 3 point, what is that, 6.3, uh, and that's out of date enough that you want to update R itself and then install all of them. Okay. It's a pain in the ass, I know, but it's good to stay up to date. Okay. For R4.0 R is actually one of the biggest changes that R has had in a version jump in a really long time. So it is actually really important to jump. It actually changes uh, the default value of how data loads into um, uh, the software. So it's actually pretty big. Okay. okay. Yeah, an explicit explanation of basic concepts like factor, vector, and object. Yes, I will give a brief explanation, but also that is everything I'm doing on uh, next Wednesday, week four is entirely on fundamental um, object types in R. So I kind of introduced all the stuff to be like, to show you some powerful tools and then nuts and bolts start next week to sort of my approach to it, which seems to sometimes work well. But I will talk a little bit about it. So basically um, there's many basic object types in R. The basic object types are um, vectors are sort of the building blocks of everything, and a vector is a one-dimensional object containing multiple elements where all the elements are the same type of data. So for instance, I could make a numeric vector like that. I could say one, two, three, four. If I get its class, you're going to see it's going to say it is a numeric vector. If I do type of, it's going to say it's a double because by default it stores things as a double precision object. I could say, is this a vector? It's gonna say true, that's what it is. It happens to be a vector. So a vector looks exactly like that. It's a one dimensional object. It has a length of four is the number of elements in it. That's a vector. A list looks a lot like a vector. So if I say, list, you'll notice it looks a little bit different in its output. This thing, this list looks like that as compared to this vector here. Each element of this list here is actually a length one vector. If I get a length on list, it is also a one dimensional object with four elements. Lists are a more powerful object type because unlike a vector like this, in a vector, every one of these elements has to be exactly the same data type. In a list, every element could be a different data type. I could have this be hams, I could have this be a length three vector, and I could have that be the MT cars data set. This uh, list here now, its first value is one, its second one is hams, its third one is a length three vector, and its fourth element is the entire MT cars data set. Lists are powerful because they are arbitrary. You can do anything you want with them. Um, I don't show lists to begin with because they're weird and they're confusing. Um, but lists are look like this. The thing about lists though is that um, data frames in R, like the MT cars data set, MT cars is a data frame. But if I go length on it, it says it has a length of 11. Well, it's kind of weird to think that an object that is rectangular like that has a length and only has one dimension. Data frames are a type of list. So lists are very powerful. Data frames are a restricted version of a list where every element of the list must be the same length, but they're actually a type of list. Matrices are a different animal. So if I say, convert this to a matrix, it looks a little different, but now if I get length on it, 
352 is the number of elements, that is the number of cells in that matrix. Matrices are a totally different type of object, even though they look square like a data frame. With matrices, you can get dimensions. They look like that. If I get the dimensions of the original MT cars, it's the same because in R, data frames look, and look like and pretend to be a matrix, but in fact, they are a list. So lists are sort of this master object type that are important to know how to work with, but they're deeply confusing. So we're gonna spend time on them next week. The basic idea in R is the atomic most simple object is a vector. The most powerful flexible object is a list. Everything in R is in between those two objects as a type. Um, even though anything can be made into a list, like this vector like this is a, uh, well, it's a, it is itself sort of a, uh, like a list. Lists are sort of everything in R, but they're really confusing. So the idea is that like most of the things like a column and a data frame must be a vector of some kind, but there's many types of vectors. So for instance, I could say A, B, C, this is still a vector, A, B, C, but if I go get class on this, it's gonna say it's character data. This is a vector of type character. I could make it a factor, with factor, Victor, there we go. Now it would be a factor. This is what a factor looks like. So compare this to the character. So this says ABC levels ABC. If it's a character one, it doesn't have levels. What the levels are essentially is factors are sort of an old style R data object that stores categorical data as numbers and associates those numbers with a level. So the factor here, it says A, B, and C, but in reality, this is the number one, this is the number two, this is the number three, associated with level one, level two, and level three. Meaning, this is weird. If I say as.numeric, it will say one, two, and three. If I don't have it be a factor first, it will say error, because you can't turn a character data into a number, but weirdly, you can make a factor into a number because it's actually numbers underneath the hood. This is a weird technical kind of uh, thing. Factors have an underlying numeric representation, which is just an R thing, right? And this is confusing, um, but it's a way that R can uh, sort of perform certain special tasks with categorical data. So do you have any other sort of questions about that? Thank you very much. That's really helpful. OK, yeah, and we're going to spend way too much time on it here in, uh, uh, in week four, uh, going over um, like the nuts and bolts. I just try and give three people three weeks of cool stuff, and then we get into, the, into annoying stuff for a week, back to cool stuff, back to annoying things. So we'll get it. OK. Anybody else? See you folks on Monday then.